Um, well, welcome to uh, the registered funds breakout session. If this is not the breakout session you wanted to be in, um, you can't leave. <laughs> um, we're going to be discussing a number <coughs> of issues uh, that have uh, related to registered investment companies, mutual funds, and, and so forth. Uh, my name is Ken Berman. I'll be moderating the panel. I'm a partner in the investment management group of Debo Boys and Clinton. But let me introduce uh, the other members of the panel. In particular, we are fortunate to have two members of the SEC staff joining us today. Uh, first, Thoreau Bartman, who is a senior special counsel in the uh, Division of Investments Management's, uh, one of the Division of Investment Management's rulemaking office. Uh, Thoreau has been on the staff, I think, for over 10 years and has played a significant role in a number of major rulemakings, including money market reform and of particular relevance today, uh, the mutual fund liquidity rule. Uh, he played a role in both uh, a leading role in its adoption and continues to play a leading role in its implementation. Uh, also joining us from the SEC staff is Roberta Ufford. Uh, she is a senior special counsel in the analytics office of the Division of Investment Management. For those of you who aren't familiar with, with the structure of the division, the analytics office uh, monitors trends in the investment management industry and carries out the division's outreach and examination program. And I stress the division's examination program, not OC's examination program. It's a separate program. Um, and as she'll discuss, she also contributes to the work of the uh, division's uh, rulemaking offices. We also have two panelists who um, can provide, will provide industry perspectives on some of the issues that we're talking about today. First, uh, Joanna Catalucci is a senior managing director, chief compliance officer, and senior compliance manager of Guggenheim Partners. In this role, uh, she leads the strategic direction of the comp uh, comprehensive compliance program of the firm, focusing on compliance requirements and legal issues. Prior to joining Guggenheim, Joanna worked at a number of firms, including Ridex SGI, Chase Global Fund Services, and Price Waterhouse Cooper. So she has uh, significant experience in the industry. And finally, uh, Rana Wright, who is the general counsel of Harris Associates where she is responsible for managing the legal, compliance, risk, and regulatory functions of Harris Associates globally. Uh, Ron has also had prior experience in the fund industry, uh, both with Bank of America, and um, where she oversaw, um, she was chief counsel overseeing Merrill Lynch's distribution. And uh, she also was at Reed Priest, and uh, uh, Reed Smith, I'm sorry. Um, we're going to become covering a number of issues today. Hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them, but, but we only have an hour. And but the other thing I wanted to emphasize is we look forward to this panel being interactive. And by interactive, I don't just mean among the panelists. If you have questions as we go on, please feel free to, uh, to ask them. Uh, you can just raise your hands and we'll, we'll call on you. Or I think there are cards and you can submit them uh, anonymously if that's, that's your inclination, but we really do encourage you to ask questions during the course of the panel rather than waiting until the end in the event that we don't have time at the end. Um, we thought we should lead, lead off with an issue that um, may be uh, preoccupying many of you, uh, may, may not be preoccupying some of you, and that relates to the um, implementation of the mutual fund liquidity rule. Um, as it, it is, uh, the compliance states have already begun to kick in in some respects. And uh, Thoreau has been responding to, I think, a lot of the questions that have come up in the that context. So Thoreau, why don't you lead off by discussing the current status of the rule and types of issues you're seeing? Absolutely. Um, first off, you know, if you've ever seen an SEC person speak, they have to give you the standard disclaimer. Um, anything I say today is my own views and may not necessarily represent the views of the commission or the staff. Um, so what I was going to do is give you a quick uh, high-level overview of the liquidity rule. We're talking one minute, because I'm assuming most of you know what it is at this point. And then move into a couple of the changes that have happened recently, the FAQs that have been issued, and some of the implementation issues that we and the staff have been seeing. Um, so first off, you know, for those of you who, you know, you, I'm sure you all are familiar with it, but the liquidity rule requires 
funds to uh, have a liquidity risk management program with certain you know, provisions, including having, a, having uh, an administrator responsible for that program, uh, having board approval of the program. And as part of that program, the all, fund, all open and funds need to engage in a classification of all of their securities into four different buckets. They also need to establish what's called a highly liquid investment minimum, uh, which is a minimum amount of assets that they can turn into cash uh, in three days or less as a means of addressing you know, redemption requests and, and, and other you know, short-term cash needs. Um, and they also have to comply with what's called the 15% illiquid asset minimum, where they have to keep no more than 15, well, they can't purchase additional illiquid assets if they have more than 15% of their assets in assets that are illiquid. Um, so, you know, that, the, the, the liquidity rule, uh, you know, ha is broad and sweeping and people have had a number of questions uh, relating to it as they have begun implementing it. We gave a two year uh, uh, compliance date uh, implementation period. Uh, we heard from people that that wasn't enough. Uh, so we actually ended up providing a six month extended compliance date uh, period for certain aspects of the rule, namely the classification requirements and certain parts related to the classification. Uh, this was largely in response to some concerns we heard about vendor readiness as well as other issues with getting classification in, in an order. So as of today, right now, uh, registered funds, registered, registered open end funds should have a liquidity risk management program in place. That compliance date has already passed. It doesn't need to be approved by the board at this point. That will happen in June. Uh, but they do need to also be complying with that 15% limit on illiquid assets. In June, for, and I, I, I must say, you know, this, all, all of the dates I'm talking about really only apply to large entities. Small entities have an additional six months to comply with most of these provisions. Um, but as of June, the full rule kicks into effect. Uh, so also as part of that you know, process where we looked at you know, delaying the compliance date, we also engaged in a, uh, we, we heard a lot of feedback about the rule as adopted in 2016, some concerns about very you know, particular issues with it. And we actually ended up modifying it slightly prior to the compliance date implementation. So last year, late last year, we issued a, some, some rule amendments that would essentially do two primary things. The first is, uh, as part of the original adoption, funds would have been required to, on a quarterly basis, provide a kind of a profile of their liquid assets, uh, of, their, of the liquidity of their assets, um, kind of broken up into, you know, I always think of it as like a pie chart. You know, you know here's the portion that's illiquid, here's the portion that's, you know, highly liquid, et cetera, et cetera. There was some serious concern from the industry about that public disclosure, uh, especially a lot of that revolved around concerns about comparability of that data between funds because of the underlying methodolog methodological you know, differences between funds and how they come up with that classification, uh, as well as some other concerns as well. The, the, the commission, you know, heard that and ended up modifying that requirement. They, they, they eliminated that public disclosure uh, the, of the, the actual classification and replaced it with what's hoped to be more user-friendly and less prone to investor confusion, disclosure in the fund's uh, annual or semi-annual report about the operation and effectiveness of the liquidity risk management program. So that, so that will you know, start coming into effect you know, after June in a series of, you know, there, there, there's some triggers there basically, you know, that first disclosure comes into effect after the board has first reviewed the program. So most of that kind of um, uh, the, the, the operation and effectiveness disclosure and the, the funds annual and semi-annual report won't probably start coming into effect until later this year or even next year. Uh, the other main change they, uh, that we, we, we did was to provide some additional flexibility on form endport. So as part of the liquidity rule generally, uh, funds would be required to, on a monthly basis, submit the liquidity classification of their fund holdings to us on form endport. It was originally adopted as a very strict, you know, must, every, class, every security had to have one liquidity classification and one liquidity classification only. We got some feedback that that may be overly strict especially in certain cases where you know, different portions of the same 
uh, holding might have different liquidity characteristics. For example, you purchased part, part of the holding on the open market and part of it through a private placement that was subject to, to limitations. Um, also, in some cases, you know, there's differences between sub-advisors' views on the classification of, of, an asset, of the same asset. So we provided some flexibility on form and port to allow that, uh, to allow, allow uh, holdings be split up into multiple pieces. And then finally, this is something I just want to, you know, uh, kind of bring to everybody's attention. The, the commission also committed to a staff evaluation of the uh, operation of the liquidity rule, its cost and benefits, and other potential approaches that could you know, achieve the same goals over time. Uh, it was in the release. We opened up an email inbox. Uh, so we are looking for constant feedback. So as you continue to implement the rule, you know, we would like additional feedback on how, that, how it's going. Have you been getting feedback? So right now, we've gotten not necessarily feedback through that email box, but through people emailing me. <laughs> um, but you know, please feel free to, you know, send the, the, that email inbox is open. We are looking at it. And you can also contact me as well or other people in the, in the division. So, um, I, I think I just mentioned the compliance dates. You know, one other big issue has been, you know, it, it, it is, a, it is a, 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 it's a big rule. There's a lot of questions that come up after the adoption as you know, uh, the, the, the funds start grappling with the actual nitty gritty rubber to the road kind of implementation. So as part of that, we put together a several rounds of FAQs to address you know, um, some of the bigger issues that have been faced. Um, they, uh, 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 they are on a range of topics, but I, I like to bucket them into three kind of big buckets. The first bucket is kind of sub-advisor issues. Uh, the sub-advisor FAQs provide guidance on how a fund can implement and manage a liquidity risk management program with multiple sub-advisors, how it you know, can oversee those sub-advisors, and how it can deal with different classification processes from different sub-advisors. So if you are a, you know, a fund of sub-advisors, I would highly recommend looking at those FAQs. Another tranche of FAQs dealt with issues related to in-kind ETFs. In-kind ETFs are treated separately under the rule. They are subject to certain later provisions. They don't have to engage in classification. They don't have to have a highly liquid investment minimum. Um, however, becoming an in-kind ETF was left you know, somewhat vague in the rule. And in particular, an in-kind ETF is defined as something that uses, that a fund that only uses a de minimis amount of cash in its redemptions. That de minimis, what, what is de minimis raised a lot of concerns across the industry. So we issued some FAQs that tried to put some boundaries around that. You know, we gave kind of comfort that a fund that uses 5% um, or less cash, you know, according to various metrics, like either on a basket by basket or kind of a rolling average basis, is pretty much guaranteed to be de minimis. And we gave guidance indicating that if it's over 10%, it's almost certainly not a de minimis use of cash. And if it's kind of in between, it really is kind of facts and circumstances dependent. So, and there's some other FAQs we gave on that. Uh, and then finally, we gave a lot of guidance on just the classification process generally, how you would engage in kind of uh, ongoing monitoring of certain things that are kind of daily basis requirements, like the liquid asset minimum, the liquid asset limit, and the high liquid investment minimum. Uh, those are kind of required to be kind of a daily kind of, you know, you know monitoring process. But at the same time, uh, the rule permits a monthly classification process of all the assets. So trying to work, the FAQs kind of give you some guidance on how to work between that and get the, address that tension. Do you expect that there may be additional FAQs in the future? I mean, the so you have literally just read my mind. <laughs> um, so the, the, the next thing I was going to just highlight is that, you know, we are always open to additional FAQs, and we are actually, you know, addressing. I was going to give you a couple examples of things that we're considering whether guidance would be useful to people. You know, right now we uh, haven't issued any more FAQs since that last round, which is you know six months ago. But we are actively considering. You know, one thing that you know became apparent after the 15% um, liquid asset limit went into effect in December, as well as the requirement to file a form and liquid with us if a fund were to go over and over that 15 percent is that there are certain kinds of events that may 
trigger a technical violation. I am thinking in particular of certain things like if you're a fund that has a lot of foreign market uh, holdings and that foreign market shuts down for a week, which does happen. For a holiday. For a holiday. Right. right. Yes, for like Chinese. As opposed to an earthquake. As opposed to an earthquake. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, so, you know, like, for example, you know, a lot of, you know, Asian markets shut down in light of the Chinese Lunar New Year celebration. And uh, Japan, you know, has another large, long shutdown coming up soon, uh, you know, in conjunction with their emperor's coronation, I believe. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of questions raised about whether or not a fund should file an unliquid in that situation. Um, it, it, is an area that we're considering guidance, but it's, it's ripe and we're kind of focused on it because you know, it, it became clear that this was an area that people had different views on. Uh, another area is you know, as people are starting to implement their classification process, you know, uh, a lot of questions around derivatives and how derivatives should be classified have been coming up, so that's another area that we're aware of and focused on. Um, so with that, I mean, we are always open to additional FAQs and guidance. Please just reach out, let us know if you have anything you want to, you know, us to talk about. We do it both formally and informally. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, I'm sure many of you are, are dealing with implementation of, of, of this rule. Um, and uh, Rod or Joanna, I mean, I, can you speak generally about some of the issues that, that you've had to face in, in implementing the rule? Sure, certainly. Um, as a CCO uh, working at a firm that interacts with a risk uh, management group that is already handling the stress testing, um, I went through and worked with my team and decided sort of like the mental checklist of how we're going to implement things. So as Thoreau was uh, talking about, you know, we needed to make sure certainly that we had uh, the uh, liquidity risk uh, uh, administrator named or the, I don't know the exact title, but the administrator of the program. Whether or not you want to have a committee, uh, depending upon the size of your organization, you, know, you might be a committee of one or you might be a committee of, of many. Um, at, our firm, uh, I'm not actually involved in the uh, calculation or the determination of what's liquid or not. I'm focused more on making sure that we have policies and procedures updated. So also the 30A1 manual. So thinking about your Section 17, your cross-grade policies and procedures. You want to revisit those and uh, factor in uh, liquidity. So if you have a cross-grade between the 40 Act bonds, you're not going to cross something that's a liquid. But perhaps you have cross trades where a 40 act fund and another account at your firm that's not a 40 act, one has it classified as liquid, one has it classified as illiquid. How are you going to be able to handle that? So addressing can, that. Can, can I jump in real quick? Uh, you know, the liquidity rule actually had a couple sec a couple of pages on cross trade. So hopefully everybody looks to that as they read yes. their compliance. So like, uh, reductions in kind. I, I think that you know that might not be a really uh, common event, but it is something that's addressed in your compliance or your fund manual. So you want to look at that and think about factoring in how you would get either your liquidity administrator uh, working with your risk department that's perhaps doing your stress testing and making a determination uh, that is in the, the best. Uh, 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 it makes the most sense, if you will, for the fund to do that reduction in time. Factoring in now part of the liquidity program as part of that determination. Um, Again, there's a few pages. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, highly so pointing to the release. So, <laughs> those if you have any questions. so all those are important. I also think workflow is really important from an implementation standpoint. So you have your ongoing monitoring that's happening for your 15% of liquid. Uh, you've got your monitoring requirements in place, making sure surveilling or working with your risk department, your highly liquid investment minimums. You've got board reporting, um, and then you also have you know, how you want to incorporate into your annual CCO report as well. Um, uh, I'm not talking about using a vendor because uh, the firm that I work with, we developed our own. But certainly to the extent that you have a vendor and you're working with them, developing some kind of oversight program and understanding how they are uh, handling any changes to the program. So you're not caught off guard, you're understanding perhaps they're having meetings to help you understand how they're managing the, the data, collecting it and, and using it to implement and your understanding of how they're reporting it out to you. Um, I also think too on your checklist, I would probably add something about making sure that the disclosure is there. So it's my understanding that I think you'll have that general discussion around the program in your annual semi-annual report where you uh, 
have your also your conversations about 50 <coughs> So I think it's suggested you follow your annual um, advisory contract renewal disclosure. You would put something about the effectiveness of the program as well. Um, so those are just some of the, the things that, you know, the 15% was the, the rule came out and codified that, but I think most firms were probably already monitoring to that percentage, um, whether you were using uh, daily data or some kind of frequency based upon how frequently you could get it updated into your system, how often people were weighing in and revisiting what had already been classified as a little bit. Uh, so that was probably already something folks were monitoring. So those are some practical things that I think are, you know, real for uh, today. And factoring into your end board process. So your, your first filing will be either July or April of 2020, depending on if you're large or small. Uh, and just making sure that you factor that into the existing workflow that's already in place for end board. Um, thanks, Joanna. That was very thorough, and I think just to be additive to the conversation, because I think you walked through um, all the a lot of the tactical steps on the mental checklist. For, for us, Harris is a long only equity shop invested heavily in large caps. So we really took it as an opportunity to have our discussion about liquidity. So we already had our narrative on liquidity and how we operated with our board, and it's really become education of really understanding liquidity and what, what happens in a variety of events. And we've got kind of a contingency uh, liquidity event waterfall, if you will. And so I think for us, it, we went through all of the very tactical steps and determining you know, we're the administrator, we have a committee of seven, we have a fund-only CTO and an advisor uh, CTO. So there's a lot of people engaged in the dialogue. And what I found from a practical perspective is that we were making it something that it wasn't and we had to go back to the release and the guidance because there is a lot so to your point when you go back you realize there's a lot of information there and we needed to anchor ourselves in what the rule was requiring because we were going off on a variety of tangents to try to be compliant with the rule and the conversation about liquidity is so robust that it, it did each one of those cross trades redemption in kind each one of those could be a, a treatise in and of itself. And so how do you get all of that in a program that the board will actually read to approve and then have a conversation? We we are using a vendor, so then that's just another thing for, for the board to understand. And so the vendor comes in and educates on how they look at derivatives and all of those conversations are so detailed that having a roadmap about how you can describe it to the board. And for us, we were giving them something that always looked green, right? We're highly liquid, are you happy? And so they're like, yeah, we want more than that, right? And so then we're trying to drop a bomb on like what would happen to get some yellows and reds in here. And again, we started to drift from the intent of the rule and the purpose. And so we're just anchoring back to these FAQs, the release, and the guidance to give yourself a clear roadmap because it could get all encompassing and it is one that you can be very tactical about. That's, that's really Thank you very much for both of that. Yeah, there's obviously a disclosure component to this rule through the forms. Roberta is actually a, maybe the primary end user of, of these disclosures. Uh, is there anything to discuss about those forms or um, well, what they're going to be used for? Yes. Um, let me start with talking a little bit about the, new, the most recent rule change with NPORT, which changed the implementation schedule. And I think we had a little bit of a preview of that from Joanna, but I'll just walk you through the rule for those of you who've got questions about what happened. Sort of take a big step back. Um, form NPORT is a form that will be filed quarterly now by registered investment companies to report their portfolio holdings and some other information, including risk metrics. And it was adopted at the same time as another form, Form NSEN, which registered funds file annually to report some census information, you know, sort of annual, on an annual basis. At adoption, the two forms had the same initial compliance date, which was June 1, 2008, last year. And NSEN has gone ahead. Um, and in that, that form is already being filed with us by those whose compliance dates have come, come, and, come and gone. Um, but for import, there has been a change in how the implementation is. One other thing about import adoption is that we broke it up into tiered filings, so larger fund groups were supposed to are going first, and then smaller fund groups. Initially, um, the first thing that happened with the import schedule is there was a delay in filing. 
um, a determination of, to delay the filing of import on Edgar by nine months. So that pushed the large fund group compliance date to April 1, 2009, so soon, 2019, so soon now, and then April 1, 2020 for the smaller fund groups. And then just last month, at the end of last month, there was the interim final rule. So to understand what the interim final rule did, um, we'll back up to sort of how it was proposed to adopt, or how an adoption form import would be filed, which was monthly. We filed import monthly, um, every month with portfolio holding data, 30 days after the end of the month. The third quarter, or the third month in each quarter, that data would become public after another 30-day delay. So 60 days after the end of quarter date, the data would be public, first and second months stay non-public. So what the interim final rule has done is sort of pushed the filing dates out so that now you file import quarterly. You include all three months' data in the filing. You file 60 days after the end of the quarter, which means that third quarter monthly data becomes publicly, public immediately on filing. We still get all the same data, just a little bit later, and it also means that some of the data is public immediately on file, which means we hold just a little bit less non-public data on a long-term basis. And when we receive it, it's a little bit more stale, which folks like to think that makes it a little um, less sensitive from the fund's perspective, but still useful to us. Don't make no mistake about that. Um, we do still have access to the data a little bit earlier, as with the nine-month compliance, the extension of compliance date, and also with the monthly holdings going forward. Funds will have to have that data available to us 30 days after the end of the month. So if exam staff comes in, we can look at that data, even though it won't yet be filed on Edgar. Okay, so as we get this data, what are we going to do with this? I'm going to sort of sidetrack a little bit and talk about my office, the analyticals office, and what we did. And Ken gave you a little preview, but <laughs> what I'd like to say about our office is our core work is managing and analyzing industry and market information to support the division's work. That's what we do. And we have a diverse staff, diverse in terms of skill sets. We have quantitative data analysis, uh, financial analysts, we also have lawyers like me, and we have examiners, and we have some industry experts. How many people are in, in the we office? We have 20. 20 staff. Which, 20. Which maybe sounds like a lot, and maybe not when you think the amount of data that's coming in. Yeah, just by way of reference, when I left the staff in 2000, I think maybe one or two people who were, were there just in to the crunch that. I think one of them may still be there. All of them all retired. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's some folks who are in older groups, and but now we have about 20. And we've actually grown over the last couple of years, notwithstanding, um, you know, there's been hiring freeze and stuff, but our group has continued to get resources. But even so, 20 people is not a lot for, I think, the kind of work we do. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Not in the new commission. Not in the new commission. All right, so with these sort of mixed people, um, we have a multidisciplinary approach to what we do. And we're using data together with our outreach exam capabilities. So we use outreach uh, to get information, that market and industry information that's relative or relevant to and informs the division work. And that work is making rules, issuing guidance, and doing disclosure review functions. Um, our outreach informs liquidity rulemaking, for instance, and it informs other rulemaking. And we also use, learn, use it to just learn like what's going on out of the market when things happen, whether it's a market event, like something bad, like a hurricane, or maybe Brexit, and we use that outreach. When we do outreach, what we're doing is we're calling you. We're calling somebody in this room, or somebody who might be in this room, and we're asking questions, and we're trying to just learn some things, gain some insight, but that'll be an exam. That, that's the idea. We definitely do use our exam capabilities as well. When we do, though, we are doing an exam that's intended to help us learn more about the industry, to learn more about the subject matter. It's not a compliance exam, so it's really, we like to think that it's different from an OC exam. Do you coordinate it all with OC? That's a really good question, and it was coming right up. Absolutely, we coordinate with OC. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 a, it's a really important question. I think people have that question. We don't call unless we've gone through OC and checked to see what they're doing. And it doesn't mean we won't call you if they're already doing a compliance exam, but we will have talked to them and understand what they're looking at. And from time to time, OC's already got an exam underway, and we might, we might join that exam team. So, 
and that does happen. Um, something to understand about our exam and outreach efforts is we definitely use data to inform what we're doing. Um, so we look at data and we say, wow, that might be interesting and that might inform some outreach or we might have a question and we'll start with the data to figure out the right place to call. But at the same time, all of that, that outreach and exams definitely informs the data. We get a lot of different data points. They could tell us a lot of different things and it's that ability to talk to you through outreach and exam and understand what's going on with the data, what's actually happening real when you go look at it versus what the data says to you. It helps us really understand the data sets. Um, my one other point about this coordinating OC, so um, one thing I want to point out about the data on NPORT and NSEND, which is very exciting from our point of view in the analytics office, is this is structured data. And what does that mean? Well, structured data in XML format is data that can be combined into data sets for analytics. You can combine multiple filings. But we have to do manual data entry. And that's a big deal. And we can integrate it with other data sets that we have, like the data sets we get from PF. Um, and the data sets we get on money market funds on um, NMFP, which are also in the XML format. As a comparison, sort of as we come up to the implementation of these new forms, we've been dealing with forms that are not in structured data formats. That makes them, they're really, they're easy for people to read if you're a human, but machines just don't read those forms very well. And it's very hard for us to do any you know, analysis from the data that we get in on those forms. So, the adding of the import and send data in the XML format is going to make really give us a big sort of leg up and allow us to take a big leap forward in the kinds of analytics that we can do and what we can look at. So we're pretty excited about it. So that gets us to what do we really do with all that data I'm talking about with 20 people, some of whom aren't even data analysts, um, experts. Um, well, we do like about four different things in four different categories, and I'll sort of run through those. But let me start by saying that we already have data, NMFP and Form PF data, and we're using it. So the NPOR and SEN forms and the kinds of information and the way we ask information about it, some of what's on there was informed by what we already do with the data from Form PF and the data from Form NMFP. So one thing you could do if you just want to understand how the Commission as a whole uses data is read the PF, Form PF Annual Report to Congress, where Congress has asked us how do we use data. And the sorts of things we talk about with Form PF data in that report are the sorts of things we might do with NPORT and SEND data. And if you were to read the release for NPORT and SEND, you would see continually references about this is what we did with PF data, or we have this experience with PF data, and we're going to translate that data. So that kind of is a big question. So the first thing we're, we do with data is access and security. And I put them together because you want to make sure data is in a data set and that you can combine with other data sets. And the people who do analytics can get to the data and use it for analytical purposes. And I'm a lawyer. I don't know how many of you are all lawyers. But I will tell you, coming to the analytics, one of the things that was a big learning curve for me is that's not a small thing to do. It is a thing. Getting the data in and making sure that it's available to be used by people who need to use it. But connected to that, though, is a security process. We have data on endpoint that will be confidential and stay confidential. And that is a matter that the Commission takes very, very seriously, and our office takes it very, very seriously. So let me be clear about that. Um, if you read the Form PF annual report, you see we have policies and procedures designed to limit access to the people who are going to use the data, sort of a need to know. So that data is not floating around the Commission. It's available to those who need to know it, and there's records and tracks about who's authorized and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, we want the right people to have access, and so we do also build systems, although they have limited access, but the idea is to let people be able to see the data. The second thing we do is we want to learn about and improve the quality of the data. So there's a couple of different things that we do there. One is the analysts look at that data. As they start to analyze it, they look for anomalies in the data. They look for outliers, weird things, potential errors, and missing and delinquent forms. And when they find them, our first step will be outreach. We'll give you a call and find out if there's a problem. And then if there is a problem, we'll talk about how to fix it. 
Um, eventually, when problems aren't fixed, it can elevate, but our first step is really to pick up the phone and, and give you a call and try to resolve it. And, and it can be that simple. So, so I, I, here's a question where, again, I, if you look at the OC risk alert concerning uh, examination priorities, I'm sorry, not the risk alert, examination priorities, one of their priorities is aberrational performance that they see. Um, I think this may have been the registered investment company. Aberrational performance, that's something that they will focus on. Are, are you coordinating with them in identifying areas of aberrational performance? So I want to distinguish that sort of exam targeting okay. from, because they're looking for certain things that are happening, right? Mm -hmm. And they're looking for it so they can go do an exam because they have a feeling something's wrong. And yes, we have conversations about what we see in the data. But I'd like to say that what I'm talking about at this level is really preliminary. We just see stuff. You know, you know, we look and last month you reported, reported something at a million and this month it's twelve it's a hundred million. You know, maybe somebody just put an extra finger on a zero. And we're that's that's the kind of corrections I'm talking about. That's not to say that down the road that kind of aberrational perform uh, you know, aberrational performance won't be something that is targeted in exam or that we don't have some input in helping OC and DIRA really develop those analytics to be able to target that. Is that? Yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, OC has it's an, an entire, like, office devoted to targeting specific funds using analytics okay. like and in, in like selecting their risk exam the, 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 the risk based exam so you're not you're so not really not screening us. for them yeah. you're, you're doing your thing for yeah. really regulatory purposes well yes but i mean i think that you, it's it's helpful to understand that the work is iterative right so i'm talking now about a process of validating and just looking at it and saying, is the data we're getting right? Because in addition to just calling out, we'll also use outreach and exams at this point. Because we'll keep saying, we'll say, how come these kinds of funds report this way? And it's not a compliance <coughs> question, it's a why question. Mm -hmm. And that's really the job of our office, is to get to the why. And sometimes that generates FAQs, you know, or it generates further conversations or further guidance. Hey, how come everybody's doing it this way? And we go back and look and say, yeah, but you know, maybe that's not what we wanted. And sometimes to make a change in that is a rule change, absolutely. But sometimes it's something where you can do something with guidance. Okay. But what, that's what we're trying to do is understand what's in the data and what's happening. We will use outreach and exams, and we'll use exams to, to do that kind of learning about the database process. All right. Makes sense? So that's really helpful. Thank you. OK. All right. So then the third thing we're going to do is we're going to develop some processes and tools that allow us to both facilitate reporting and also allow us to get into the data and really look at it. Um, if you look at for private funds, for instance, we talk about building tools that do a whole range of things, including you know picking out outliers on things like performance, investment exposures, liquidity, certainly leverage in the private funds. You know, we're going to talk about that. Um, we'll also look at policy interest subjects like you know certain kinds of investment strategies or exposures to certain markets. And those, those are capabilities we have now with the PF database. Um, another example of a tool that we built is something called Magic, and Dolly has talked about this tool. It's monitoring analytics GUI for investment companies. It sounds much better when we say Magic, but it's an internally developed tool. And it pulls data in from a bunch of search sources. It can be used by analysts and non-analyst staff. It's a tool that um, the disclosure review people use because it helps them be able to pull up information on a fund kind of right away and see a picture. Um, we can use it for custom queries on funds, and we do. So we could identify a set of funds with exposure to certain assets. Uh, we can ask how the fund's portfolio compares to its strategy or are its holdings aligned with investment restrictions. We can do those kinds of things now with the MAGIC um, application. The really cool thing about MAGIC is it's pretty dynamic, which means we're going to be able to add new data sets like NSA. And bringing in that new, um, those new data sets will make the MAGIC tool much more powerful you know, to be used across the division. All right, so then finally we get to the main point, you know, where I started, which is our goal is to support the growth of the vision. And so in that context, what does it mean for us to use data and do analysis to inform policy? And that involves a couple of things. One is we're looking at activities and trends. 
Um, you know, for example, in the in the release, final release, we talked about using import and send data to, for example, look at leverage derivatives or securities lending or counterparty exposures of particular funds. Or we could look at them industry wide. We can also combine in looking at trends and looking for new things that are developing or things of policy interest. Um, we can combine the data set now with private funds data, money market funds data, to get a more holistic view of the asset management industry. And again, looking at activities and trends so that the people who are making policy, the growth group, knows what's going on. <laughs> and you know, more specifically, we also use this data to assess the impact of rulemaking. So, for instance, in connection with liquidity, we did outreach. Um, in connection with money market reform, you know, certainly it's in the public realm that we've used data from PF and NMFP to look at what happened as those rules became implemented, we were implemented, and that helps our policymakers understand the impact of their actions and helps us understand what might happen if we do <coughs> something else going forward. So, it's so very important to help the division do its job. And then finally, we do use the data to inform the public. Um, for instance, we publish a public report from NMFP data. We publish public reports from, um, from PF data. What our goal is in publishing those reports is really twofold. One is we want to inform the public just by getting data out there. We're also looking for some feedback. When we put reports out, how does the industry use them? Do they kind of agree with our take on what's going on in data? Data is you know, really just what people decide to count. And there's always an opinion in what you decide to count. <laughs> and then we also, just having our data out there facilitates discussion in the public sphere. Right, that's extremely helpful. Uh, do you have a formalized process for feedback, or do you just talk to people? So you can call us yeah. on particular forms. There are inboxes for all of the forms. You have particular questions about how to do filing or a question about how to plead something. Um, there are inboxes, and then I think you can call. But usually the feedback to us comes through our policy groups. Okay. Thank you. So what, we're going to spend a little bit of time now on issues that we've seen coming up in the exam process or the disclosure review process. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, I'm not going to ask our panelists how their most recent exams went <laughs> or what issues were raised with them. Um, but I, I think it's useful um, to, to uh, think about, I mean, first of all, the remarks that were made at the earlier session concerning um, the results that OC has been uh, seeing particularly in the registered investment company examinations. If, if you weren't in there, I think you uh, 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 it was reported that there were 138 exams of registered investment companies, and I believe that 52 percent of them resulted in deficiency letters, which I think is lower than the overall percentage of deficiency letters. So that seems that seems to be a positive thing. Um, OC has all, all also helpfully put out a risk alert last year dealing with issues um, that they are focusing on with respect to their examinations of registered investment companies. Um, and in their exam priorities, they noted that uh, they're looking at side-by-side -side management, that is, registered investment companies that are being managed side-by-side -side with private funds where you might have performance fees. Uh, and also, um, uh, funds that are basically being managed by people who are new to managing registered investment companies. I think that's been a trend over the past several years, so I don't think that's that still remains a priority, but I don't think it's new. The risk alert also addressed a number of other issues um, that, that OC seems to be focusing on. I would add that in the exams that, that we've been involved in that have involved either registered investment companies or BDCs, there continues to be a focus on cross-transactions. And the focus is on a number of levels. Uh, one, did you comply with 17A7? Two, if there was a trade where Fund A sold a security and Fund B subsequently bought the same security, um, you know, either OC or enforcement may be looking to see whether or not those were bona fide uh, arm's length transactions. Or they may be asking why you didn't comply with Rule 17A7 and avoid the payment of commissions. So you, you 
sort of half questions why you know whether you did comply with 1787 when you did a cross. And if you did comply with 1787, that's fine, but there are also questions about why you didn't bother to use 1787. Um, we've also seen, uh, and I don't think this is a new priority, uh, examiners looking closely at compliance with conditions and exempted orders. And at least in my personal experience, that particularly comes up where they're looking at a business development company and they're looking at uh, these, you know, whether or not they've been complying with their co-investment order. Um, I guess the question for the kind I won't ask you whether you've had those similar issues. I will ask, I mean, to what extent do you use those risk alerts to prepare yourselves for the next exam? Uh, heavily. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we actually, the, uh, the for the, the focus on the risk alert that comes out that highlights the priorities for the year, we take that uh, document and we actually match up to our uh, existing risk matrix. We create a separate tab for it and we sort of call out and document how we approach each one of those. That will also highlight for us if we want to have a special sort of focus on working group where we can talk a little bit more. That will evaluate if we need to get other groups involved. You know, because not everything is always like completely the compliance or CCO's responsibility. So we can get, you know, evaluation or uh, risk involved. We can also uh, figure out if we need to enhance our policies and procedures or perhaps even create a new one for something that's in those risk alerts. And it really helps you to, I think, think uh, strategically about what you can put into place that perhaps you don't. So the focus on executive orders, we went ahead and we have now. Uh, quarterly or uh, monthly questionnaires that we complete to ensure that we've been complying with everything, that there's not been um, instances where there's been any violations or oversight of requirements. And we also have uh, a BDC with a SMTD uh, uh, exemptive relief. So we have a checklist for every single one of those transactions. <laughs> so, Nothing really to add. I think from our perspective, it's just helpful to have a document that you can go to the CEO and say, this is why we're creating a working group, right? And so when you take that in a very tactical fashion and you can tick through, well, tracking an index, not really for us. Um, we're, we're super active, as we like to you know, say. Um, but so we can go through those with the CEO. So yeah, the, it's helpful to have those kinds of documents. The way we leverage them is exactly as Joanna said, by creating a grid going through it with the relevant business parties, um, just because the SEC said it doesn't mean it's legal compliance function responsibility. And that is something we say all the time, we'll clarity, you own this, but we'll help get you through that. Thank you. It's also helpful for board reporting. So yes. if any fun CCOs in the room, it's really great to be able to use that document to either discuss with the board what was done or to include some reference to it in your annual 30-day report because you want to get credit for everything that you do. <laughs> And I just wanted to highlight, you know, that risk alert uh, and the priorities are developed kind of like across the building. We see it as well in IM, and we also take it as kind of a roadmap for the future of like these are issues that, you know, may come up as policy issues as well in the future. So I would encourage everyone to look at the, was the November 2018 risk alert on registered investment companies. There are another number of other issues, including uh, funds that were heavily invested in securitized assets, which I guess set off some Red, red flags within the, the commission. It, it's, it's definitely worth reading to get a sense of the direction that OC and maybe the divisional committee will, will be heading, both in terms of examinations, potential enforcement, and and maybe disclosure. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time, by the way, on disclosure comments. I, I don't think we have seen many unique or unusual disclosure comments recently that are worth noting. Dahlia mentioned a couple things. One, her continued concern about the alphabetization of risk disclosures, um, as well as uh, that they're reviewing their disclosure comment process. So it may be that you'll be able, you know, after they're completed their review, you'll, you'll be seeing different types of disclosure comments and perhaps more consistent disclosure comments provided by the division. One, one thing I'll mention. And, and many of you may know this, uh, at the end of the, towards the end of last year, Barry Miller, who had been a long-time associate director who, who always saw disclosure retired um, for many, many years at the, um, at the commission, in late February, uh, Brent Fields, 
who has also been at the commission for many years, but most recently in the secretary of, secretary's office, became associate director overseeing disclosure and accounting. Um, and, you know, it may be that his arrival will have some impact on the disclosure process and so forth, so that's something to, to watch out for. Um, we're, we're coming close to the end of our time, and, and we have other things to cover, but before I do, is there any, are there any questions at this point that, that you'd like any of us to address? Okay, I'm going to, to change up the order a bit, just um, because I think there, there are some areas that you may find more interesting. And before we talk about the fund funds rule, I, wanted, I think we ought to focus on subadvisor due diligence, which I think is an area that many of you, as well as our panelists, who sit very degrees, uh, focus on. We have as part of your materials what I thought was an excellent due diligence questionnaire for subadvisor. Advisor, so I wanted to turn it over to Joanna and Joanna to sort of talk about their processes and the issues they think about in doing subadvisor due diligence. So from, from my perspective of being mindful of the time, what I've seen is just um, the robust nature of the due diligence um, is increasing. Right, and so what do I mean by that? We used to be able to just answer a few questions, maybe have a dialogue, and now it's, it could shut down certain resources um, for a, a day or two or, or even three. And so I'm, we're close coordination with our compliance folks, our legal folks, and then even our marketing team to create the standardized template responses to kind of just do a, a little more plug and play um, and, and get those responses consolidated. Uh, especially um, one of the areas is cybersecurity and data privacy. So we have our, our CISO who is responsible for um, responding to all these due diligence questionnaires. And he's also responsible for setting the strategy around cyber and privacy protection. And we'd like him to be focused there, not spending all of his time responding. And we realize that they're get the, the demands um, just responding to diligence questionnaires is really um, a, a drag on resources. So while there's so much more to say on that topic, that really is, from my perspective, where we're focusing our time on how to properly respond but balance that with the appropriate strategy around setting the tone for the, for, for the, for the company. Do you want to add to that? Uh, so we're not so much responding as we're sending out the questionnaires. <laughs> uh, and and uh, it, it, acknowledging uh, because um, the questionnaire, uh, you know, just like your policies and procedures, each year or throughout the year, taking these uh, risk alerts, uh, and other resources, your business is maybe changing, the, you know, perhaps the uh, mandate for the fund has changed. And so looking at the questionnaire and being critical of what's in there, uh, looking at all of the pre-existing questions and adding new sections, whether it's on information security policy, cyber security, uh, you know, past exams that you've had, wanting to know and create as much transparency as possible with your sub-advisors. Um, understanding if there's been the changes to the portfolio management team. Um, it's always sort of surprising that if you don't get very specific in your questions, um, sometimes information just doesn't land in, in your lap. Um, so I also think creating the dialogue on a regular basis um, so you can fill the rapport. Uh, so perhaps in between your questionnaires, they're also inclined to call you and fill you in on something that's happening in real time rather than waiting to put it in a questionnaire where perhaps someone on your team who's reviewing it looks at the answer and it doesn't completely latch on to the importance of the response. So you end up finding out about it perhaps during a 15C process and you're disappointed in yourself that you didn't take the time to sort of, uh, you know, run down a little bit more detail on things. So that would be, uh, and, and it is time consuming. So uh, that on top of RFPs, EDQs, the whole thing, it is very time consuming, so. Thank you, um, that, that's helpful. So if, if you're frustrated by the process of doing due diligence on some advisors, well, one of your alternatives is to set up on other funds, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 How does that work? That was a great transition. And, 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 you know, 
given the limitations of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the provisions of the 40 Act that present the issue for funds and funds um, or the variations of exempted orders that the SEC has provided in the fund of funds area. Suffice it to say that the um, SEC proposed a rule last or way last year um, uh, uh, that would that was designed to basically rationalize the various executive orders, rules, and no action positions uh, governing funds of funds. The comment period for the rule expires on May 2nd. The rule is not without controversy. I mean, they, they, you know, while I think the the commission tried to basically maintain the basic types of conditions that had been previously imposed. Uh, they did um, raise, uh, include a number of conditions that I think are likely to be controversial. For example, there is a provision that, a condition that would uh, limit the ability of an investing fund to uh, request redemptions of the shares of the underlying fund during a 30-day period. Um, it, the, the idea of the rule is, is to avoid the possibility that the threat of, of uh, significant redemptions uh, would uh, somehow uh, adversely affect the underlying fund. Um, it also raises the question of how that dovetails with the liquidity rule, uh, because if you wind up not be, you know, in a position where any mutual funds are presumably seven-day redemption, but you now will have potentially a significant percentage of the shares of a particular fund that you you will not be able to deal with in seven-day period because because of this rule, uh, which presumably would affect the categorization of those mutual fund shares as you know. And what bucket they go into. I, I don't know whether that, that has been a topic of conversation. Yeah. So it absolutely is a topic of conversation. I mean, it was discussed in the ETF, in the Fund of Funds release as well, as you know, that this limitation may have impacts on the liquidity classification. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I just highlight a couple of things. This is a proposal. We're looking for feedback if this is a particular area of concern. <laughs> You know, constructive alternatives are always welcome. You know, there's actually a number of alternatives that were actually discussed in the release to deal with this exact issue of kind of control. You know, I mean, under the current orders, there's kind of an elaborate kind of participation agreement. You know, you know, you know, board review process, uh, and that's teed up as an alternative. Also, other alternatives, uh, you know, include you know different or different redemption limits or different other conditions. So, I, I, if this is an area of concern, I would look to those and. Offer alternatives. Yeah, I, I will go into the detail. I, I provided an outline of materials that I think goes through the background of the rule a little bit itself and, and some of the issues that raise my best comfort in some detail. So I refer you to that. Um, we're coming to the end, and it would be malpractice not to include uh, at least a reference to a recent no action letter that the SEC staff has issued in connection with the in-person requirements for approval, among other things, the renewal of investment advisory contracts, the approval of 12, 12 B1 plans, um, and certain other issues. The, the staff issued a no-action letter to the, uh, ID, the Independent Directors Council of the ICI, basically saying that in certain limited circumstances um, where uh, either uh, the board had previously discussed the issue and concluded that they didn't need an in-person meeting to approve the contract, or where the meeting didn't occur because of a, where you couldn't have an in-person meeting because of, say, Superstorm Sandy, but you subsequently, so you approved the contract, but then you ratified it in a subsequent meeting. In those circumstances, the division wouldn't recommend enforcement action um, uh, in the event of, uh, you know, based on the failure to have an in-person meeting. One could argue whether or not uh, they could have taken an interpretive position that under the circumstances you actually did have an in-person meeting. One could also ask the question of, of whether that would, uh, the failure to literally satisfy the in-person meeting requirements, even if you're relying on the app, a no-action letter, might have 
an adverse effect in subsequent litigation. The litigators I've talked to have said no, but it's something to, to think about. But more importantly, I think it represents uh, the uh, one, one additional step in the division's outreach program to independent to fund boards to reduce the uh, burden on fund boards. I think this could reduce their burdens, but more importantly, there was a letter last year that basically recognized that chief compliance officers were often in a role to review transactions that the boards had been required to make certain findings with respect to under various commission exemptive rules. Now, uh, I think it was refreshing to have the staff finally acknowledge that chief compliance officers play a significant role in overseeing compliance and that boards don't necessarily have to get into the granular detail. On the other hand, it does create or potentially create more work for chief compliance officers, um, although presumably they would be reviewing these transactions anyway. So I think that th those are important developments in the registered fund area. I suspect you'll be seeing more board outreach initiatives that, 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 that reflect what, what they've been doing already. Um, I think our time is now up. So I want to thank the panelists for, for joining me. I, I hope you found it